Good morning to you all. My name is Nicola Bedlington, former Secretary General of the European Patients Forum, and I'm delighted and honoured to be your moderator today. This meeting is a very important milestone. It marks the relaunch of the MEP Friends of the Liver Group, an interest group of passionate and committed MEPs who care about the increasing burden of liver, liver diseases on European across the region and the opportunities to address this in a deliberate, robust way to protect future generations. We have some highly esteemed speakers who are joining us today to share their vision and perspectives in two sessions, one focused on the increasing burden of liver diseases in Europe and one on promoting prevention, care and targeted screening for higher risk groups for liver cancer. Towards the end of the meeting, there'll be an opportunity to pose questions. So please do add these to the Q&A as we are listening to our speakers. And without further ado, allow me to introduce Professor Thomas Berg, who is the Secretary General of the European Association of the Study of the Liver, to say a few words of welcome. Thomas, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicola. And uh, thank you to all of you, and especially to the MEPs for joining this meeting, um, especially in these very difficult times and the really horrible news we, we hear every day. Um, so we are really grateful, and this I want really to say in the beginning. Um, you know, ESL is a nonprofit organization. It was uh, founded in 1966 and it grows now to more than 4,500 full members, but we have a very wide community, an international and European community, of course, with more than 27,000 followers on my easel uh, with this account. So we are the leading liver association in Europe, but as I mentioned, with an international influence, and we are supporting science, wider education, and of course, patient care, uh, of patients with liver disease. We have annual meetings and our annual meeting is normally attended um, if there are no Corona times with approximately 10,000 um, attendees. Well, but the fact that we are here is really um, that the importance perhaps of liver disease and the awareness raised and that patients with liver disease are perhaps not so much on the focus also when it comes to policy um, changes and policy matters. And a reason could be that these patients and also themselves, they are blaming themselves uh, as a self-conflicted disease and there's a lot of stigma around. And this is really something we as EDL are very much aware and we are also quite aware that without the help of all the stakeholders and especially of you, and this we hope to achieve with the relaunch of the Friends of the Liver Group, we will not able really to tackle with this issue and with the huge inequity that is around in European countries around the care of patients with liver disease. And of course, the liver, and when it comes to disease, you know, and I, I mentioned the stigma, but the liver is a, um, you will see it, we also called it liver disease as a kind of a window in the future health of the European citizen. So you know that the liver is a main metabolic organ. It's kind of a power station of our body. So it reflects, liver health reflects the metabolic health. And there are excellent long-term studies done in the US and other countries where you have cohorts, you studied from the beginning when people were young, and you see in 20, 30 years, what is the outcome of these patients? And it turned out that liver markers, simply elevated liver enzymes are the best marker of whether a patient will develop diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So taking care of and being aware of these, let's say liver health, also will prevent a lot of other diseases. And just to conclude, um, we are quite aware that the liver is not the only disease we have to care of. Uh, and of course, we want to have a balanced um, representation and of course, supporting all the other patients with other diseases. So it's not to have a kind of a 
super privileged role, but really get more attention for an underserved population. This is really what we're aiming for. I think we have very good science for that. And this we want to, yeah, to bring to your attention also with this meeting. So once again, really thank you very, very much for uh, joining us for this session, um, having the, this dedicated time to listen to us. And I really look forward for a very fruitful discussion and further collaboration and cooperation with you, the friends of the liver. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas, and really outlining some of the big challenges, but also this notion of liver as a window into the health of Europeans, I think is a really important backdrop to the discussions that we're going to have today. I'd now like to give the floor to MEP Cyrus Engerer, who is a co-chair of the Friends of the Liver Group and well known for very active work on rights and on cancer. Cyrus, a very warm welcome to you today. Sure. Thank, you for, you for today. And, um, thank you for making time for us. Thank you for sharing an opening statement with all of us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for very much for having me here today. I am glad to be here with you to provide my thoughts from the perspective of the European Parliament and some personal reflections too. I would like to begin by congratulating the European Association for the study of the liver for this very timely and very much needed initiative in the European Parliament. Liver diseases in Europe are on the rise. The management of risk factors for liver diseases such as alcohol consumption, obesity, and intravenous drug use reflect behaviors and conditions that are consequences of unhealthy environments and social inequalities. Several key policy actions for marketing, pricing, and taxation of alcohol and unhealthy food could reduce liver diseases and save the lives of almost 300,000 people per year across Europe. Many recommended measures would not only decrease the burden of liver diseases, but also cardiovascular diseases and diabetes, among others. I would like to insist on the need to tackle social inequities. Policy measures such as subsidizing healthy food could help reverse the rising curve of cases in liver diseases. Furthermore, a considerable focus should be put on undeserved and marginalized communities who are at a high risk of developing chronic liver diseases. These high-risk groups include people who inject drugs, migrants and refugees, and others. And coming from the Socialist and Democrats group in the European Parliament, this is very important for us. We need strategies to put in place early diagnosis for these groups. And not only that, but we also need to run targeted health promotion interventions to overcome the current barriers. One way to tackle inequities is to address the issue of stigma. Stigma has a major impact on liver disease in Europe. Stigma leads to discrimination. It leads to the reduction in healthcare seeking behavior and reduced allocation of resources. All of these result in poor clinical outcomes. And we know that many liver diseases are preventable. This is a key message and an opportunity to implement public health strategies targeting lifestyle and social and environmental factors. In the end, these strategies reduce the incidence and the mortality associated with liver diseases and can help in saving lives. As a member of the former European Parliament Special Committee on Beating Cancer, I am particularly pleased that major emphasis is now being placed on preventing liver cancer. This committee has worked tireless, tirelessly to ensure that the European Union initiatives on cancer are robust enough to respond to the impact, both human and financial, that cancer has in Europe today, and for which prevention and early detection are very, very critical. Complementing the works were headed by the Lancet and the EASL, we now have some major tools at our disposal at the European level. We have a comprehensive blueprint in the form of the European Beating Cancer Plan. We have a new mission-driven cancer research program. We have a new innovative health initiative that will focus on innovation in all its guises, bringing together the best of academia, industry, and civil society. 
And furthermore, we have a major new EU for health funding program that has the resources and the ambition to tackle burning health problems on the agenda. One flagship initiative of Europe's Beating Cancer Plan is the European Cancer Inequalities Registry, which will provide data on cancer prevention and care to identify trends, disparities, and inequalities between member states and regions of the European Union. Such initiatives will help achieve better access to cancer care across Europe for everyone. We know that COVID is still with us. We are still grappling as a society with how to deal with immediate threats, but also how to build back better with more resilience, more humanity, and more hope. And I see today's initiative as a symbol of this. As Professor Berg says, liver health is a window to the general health challenges of Europe in the 21st century. So let's tackle this together. All of the EU institutions, in close co collaboration with learned societies and patient organizations, have a critical role to play. The joint initiative presented today provides the powerful evidence base we need to move forward decisively and deliberately to address liver diseases today. I look forward to helping to spearhead this work in the European Parliament with like-minded colleagues. And once again, my warmest congr congratulations to all of you and thank you again for this great opportunity to have this meeting today and to address all of you this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cyrus, for your obvious passion and commitment as co-chair of the Friends of the Liver Group. So resilience, humanity and hope, I think, are very, very important spirit to take this whole thing forward. And now I'd like to move to the first session of today to really understand the burden of liver diseases. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Tom Carlson, who's the co-chair of the ESL Lancet Commission, to share with us the results from this sterling work. Tom, thank you very much for joining us. In December 2000, uh, 2021, the East Lancet Commission report protecting the next generation of Europeans against liver disease complications and premature mortality was published. The goal essentially saving the lives of almost 300,000 people per year across Europe, 300,000 people. Policy actions for marketing, pricing, taxation of alcohol, unhealthy foods are, of course, of paramount importance, as we heard a little earlier. Could you, Tom, tell us about the burden of liver diseases in Europe and what can be done to actually prevent these thousands of premature deaths each year? Over to you. Thank you very much. I think you're still on mute. Could you oh. unmute yourself, Tom, please? Is it better now? Wonderful, super, thank you very much. Sorry, sorry about that. No worries. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a massive work which was done and which was presented uh, at the December 2nd launch. And I will, of course, not be able in these 10 minutes to take you through all of it, uh, but I will give you some highlights and uh, try to bring forward some very critical points of the report that I want you to remember. This is the first page of the report, and it shows the author list. There are more than 50 people co-working to, to produce this document. And the reason for showing you this is not necessarily to um, uh, make you remember all the names or to be impressed by the numbers. But the point of this list is that it's truly a multidisciplinary team. We have, of course, liver doctors, but there are also diabetologists, infectious disease specialists, nutritionists, and there are patients uh, being involved in this work. So it somehow reflects this uh, multidisciplinary platform that we need to work from. It's in many ways a mini representation of how we have to work going forward from the commission, this team which was involved in, in uh, uh, designing it. Uh, the background of the commission came um, uh, in many ways uh, uh, as a result of a change happening within liver disease research. This is uh, 
uh, timeline uh, showing the development of drugs for viral hepatitis C. And in 2014, we had the launching of the drugs which are now enabling us to cure this disease. It's the first chronic viral infection that we're able to cure. There are many effective drugs for HIV, but we cannot cure HIV. We can cure hepatitis C. And this was awarded the Nobel Prize, as you would all be aware of. This led to a massive inspiration of, of uh, liver researchers shifting their attention to possibly the biggest problem of liver disease in uh, Europe, uh, namely, uh, that which is related to uh, metabolic and alcohol-related uh, uh, exposures. And um, The Lancet had been concerned with these um, uh, uh, problems uh, over a range of uh, articles from a UK commission. Similarly, in parallel, ESL had been doing work. Some of you may be aware of these policy reports that we produced over the years, and we decided to team up uh, uh, to produce a joint uh, uh, venture uh, uh, report. And that was the uh, founding uh, of the commission, which reported in December. These are two figures that I really want you to, to, to remember. It's somehow bringing a key message related to the uh, burden uh, aspect of liver disease in Europe. And the important point is given here on the y-axis, because what you see here are working life lost, uh, meaning life lost uh, within this age span of 15 to 64 years. And then you can see a variety of diseases here. Of course, ischemic heart disease is certainly the biggest uh, uh, threat uh, to uh, this uh, patient group as in many age groups. However, you would see here that liver disease is only second, uh, closely followed by stroke, uh, lung cancer, uh, breast cancer and diabetes. And I think this point of this age group affection here is further emphasized in the figure to the right, um, which is also again um, uh, highlighting some of these diseases, uh, mainly uh, lifestyle related diseases, smoking related lung cancer, uh, obesity related type two diabetes and alcohol related liver disease. And as you can see, whilst these other uh, uh, diseases possibly are more prevalent, their um, main uh, uh, manifestation in terms of death occurs much, much later. So liver disease is a major killer of young Europeans. And I think that's, that's really the, the, the critical message coming from the commission analysis. And why is it so now that liver diseases are on the rise? We heard Thomas said that, we've, we've heard it from uh, uh, the MAPs, We've heard it from uh, uh, a variety of sources. And in many ways, this figure here summarizes the problem which is hitting Europe. Uh, we have, uh, on average, uh, very high rates of alcohol consumption in, in, in Europe, the highest rates in the world. And that's a problem in itself. However, what's happening on top of that is this obesity epidemic. So we have two major uh, problems occurring at the same time. And this is, of course, again, illustrated here, showing uh, really that there is also a correlation between these uh, uh, problems. But this is the really the, 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 the fundamental problem of the situations that Europe is sitting in, that you have this combined uh, impact of alcohol consumption and obesity. And this results in the, the, in the pictures that I showed you in the, in the previous slide. And, and, and another feature really also uh, fundamental to the, 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 the shift proposed by the, the commission is that the current emphasis of liver diseases is really focused on end stage uh, uh, problems. We talk about liver cirrhosis, we talk about cancer, uh, but we talk very little or have talked very little about early manifestations. And this is, I think, really what we are um, uh, fundamentally uh, proposing in the Commission is to shift this emphasis from uh, end stage, very costly uh, uh, efforts into uh, early uh, therapies, early detection, uh, even prevention uh, throughout uh, uh, the, the, the earliest stages of liver diseases. And uh, we to do that, we propose uh, a, a quite comprehensive 
panel of recommendations. Uh, they can be uh, explored within the commission report. Uh, what I wanted to, to show you today is really a little bit about the structure of these uh, recommendations. There is a first panel of recommendations, which is primarily targeting healthcare providers. We will not spend too much time of this. Uh, they are focusing on early detection, uh, using the tools that we have, um, bring in primary care, uh, to a bigger extent than what is happening at today, and really allow um, liver disease uh, to be recognized as a non-communicable disease, along with type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, etc. And uh, certainly the problem of stigma is also a major part of this first section of the recommendation. The second part of the recommendation is more relevant for today. We have a panel of recommendations focusing on uh, uh, policy changes. One thing is really uh, um, uh, a longstanding problem and not only related to liver disease, it's the lack of transparency with regards to drug pricing throughout Europe. There is no uniform pricing of viral hepatitis drugs or any drugs throughout the European market. There is a need to overcome this in line with the WHO uh, resolutions uh, to, to, to work on this problem. Certainly, there is also the point on uh, uh, policies to tackle alcohol, uh, particularly uh, with relation to uh, children, uh, where we propose uh, a, a social and digital media ban uh, regarding marketing of al alcohol and unhealthy food targeted to children. Uh, the children has a special place in this uh, uh, commission report, and it relates to this point that I uh, brought to you uh, earlier on, that liver disease is really a problem of, of, of the young Europeans. And there are also uh, other rec recommendations related to food reformulation initiatives, and also uh, certainly uh, this overarching uh, suggestion that we need to harmonize these. There is an harmonization going on, for instance, with relation to ERA, when you're talking about uh, 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 infectious disease threats, similar levels of harmonizations. We also need to see um, for the risk factors uh, uh, working into and driving the, the, the non-communicable disease uh, epidemic. And there is a benefit to this, not only for the patients. I mean, we will save lives, certainly. There is also a financial benefit. This is uh, modeled and shown clearly in the report. This is for hepatitis C elimination with some uh, minimal investments. You would receive uh, 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 an economic benefit occurring early uh, within uh, the next 10 years time frame and long term certainly massive savings similar uh, uh, data can be shown these are OECD data uh, with regards to the uh, policy related uh, initiatives here you can see of course uh, on the on the left side here lives saved but there is also an economic gain certainly related to food reformulation but also to uh, alcohol related and marketing related initiatives so there is, I mean, and, and you can just look at the numbers here. These are billion euros uh, 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 saved. So, so, so and, and of course, the big savings here occur not only because you're helping out liver disease patients, but because of this entangled uh, bundle of risk factors, which are driving not only liver disease, but other diseases related to our unhealthy environment, like type 2 diabetes, like obesity. So uh, by targeting liver disease and the problems of liver disease, you're helping the European in a, Europeans in a, in, in a bigger uh, space. And certainly this was also the, uh, the main point brought forward by uh, Dr. Ursula von der Leyen, who gave the keynote lecture during the launch in December. You might have seen her uh, speech. Uh, it's a wonderful talk and, and, and she's really going along with the commission in, in, in telling us how important it is that we, we, we work into these environmental risks, uh, not only to, 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 to prevent liver diseases, but to bring forward a healthier European population overall. And these initiatives needs to uh, happen uh, in Europe. Uh, they have, have to happen in a uniform way uh, throughout the European region. Uh, and I think that's really the, um, the, 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 the message that we wanted to leave you all with uh, in, in producing the, the report that there is one Europe and we have to work together jointly in the same way to overcome these problems. And that's the only way forward. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Tom, for that very clear overview of the report and its impact, calling for a paradigm shift focused on primary and secondary prevention, a big emphasis on young people and children, and also looking very clearly at the economic benefits of addressing liver diseases in a robust way. So thank you very much for that. I think that's provided some great food for thought. Moving on, I'd now like to welcome MEP Radan Kanev, who's also part of the MEP Friends of the Liver group. A warm welcome to you, Radan. I know that you're part uh, the shadow rapporteur for the amendment of a regulation which it refers to reinforcing the mandate of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're approaching that and also some of the challenges around numbers, around having a clear overview on the burden of non-communicable diseases, including liver diseases. How can Europe really address the issue through your lens as a very influential MEP? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, first uh, of all, for organizing this, uh, this event uh, uh, and then for inviting uh, me. Uh, I would uh, rather say I don't see myself as deserving 10 minutes on this panel. Uh, I'm uh, rather listening with uh, really great interest the outstanding professionals and experts uh, we have here. And uh, I think this is the most important uh, part of this change, uh, especially from my point of view, being professionally a lawyer, but uh, really wanting to be helpful as, as much as possible uh, in uh, all the debates we have on political level in uh, European Parliament. Of course, uh, I would outline some of the things I find most important, but once again, I make the disclaimer that uh, I don't think my opinion uh, is really what matters here, but the possibility of uh, political opinions to be influenced by professionals, uh, this is the really important point. Uh, of course, uh, working uh, on the uh, ECDC expansion file, uh, one of the most important parts uh, of our work, and I would say of our fight from parliamentary perspective, uh, was to enhance as much as possible uh, the engagement of CDC and of national and European administrations generally uh, on uh, the interlinkages uh, existing between communicable and non-communicable disease. Because uh, even uh, from a non-professional point of view, uh, we see uh, the great interdependencies have been uh, communicable and chronic diseases uh, in both uh, causes of uh, uh, mortal, unfortunately, diseases uh, and uh, the impact uh, of existing chronic conditions uh, for uh, patients uh, who get infected with communicable diseases. Something we saw uh, dramatically, tragically, I would say, uh, witnessed during the COVID pandemic, but which is uh, a fact of life uh, much outside the, uh, the, the pandemic before that, and uh, certainly after once it's overcome, hopefully that, uh, that will be uh, pretty soon because uh, we still live with, uh, with the COVID threat uh, around us and with victims of, uh, of COVID. And uh, still uh, the, the victims of COVID are mostly people with existing uh, chronic preconditions uh, and uh, diseases. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, we didn't make a big breakthrough uh, in this work on uh, interlinkages. However, we had it acknowledged by the final uh, regulation uh, and we have an accent on it in the review clause of the regulation. And I think what is most important, and I already dedicate certain efforts in this direction, uh, is to have a very strong uh, overview on the preparations of this uh, review uh, of the regulation. And therefore, we need uh, ECDC uh, to start gathering information on the interlinkages and to build up this European database. And I think a real strong, uh, robust uh, database for almost half a million uh, 
people living in the Euro European Union uh, and uh, the respective uh, number of uh, people medically treated uh, throughout the revision period. Uh, this is the data we need to uh, really mm, prevent uh, most uh, effectively uh, the, uh, the death or uh, uh, grave health conditions caused uh, by the interlinkage between uh, chronic and infectious uh, diseases in the future. Uh, and uh, being closer to the topic of today's discussion and of our interest, uh, intergroup, uh, of course, with an accent uh, on uh, liver conditions and liver disease. So this is one point I can see uh, ourselves as policymakers, as legislators useful. Uh, the other obvious point uh, is in uh, what uh, Professor Carlson uh, so uh, well explained the, the policy basis of uh, prophylactics of prevention, uh, uh, vaccinations where we uh, know already it works or in fields that we are not so much advanced yet, but gathering enough data, promoting enough research, and uh, eventually uh, promoting vaccination as a process. Of course, uh, we might uh, see it as a solution in uh, fields of our health uh, that uh, we don't have such solutions for the moment. And of course, uh, during the, the COVID pandemic, in its later phase, uh, we saw how difficult the task uh, having the population vaccinated is, especially in some of the countries in Europe. I come from Bulgaria, sadly the less vaccinated European society, and one of the less vaccinated society overall in the world, uh, by the way. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, among uh, the populations that have unlimited access to vaccines, it is certainly the less uh, uh, the less successful vaccination campaign uh, whatsoever. And we must have our uh, conclusions from, from these problems as well. I will not open the brackets uh, about propaganda now, because especially during these days, uh, it's an endless uh, theme and uh, better stick to the, stick to the topic. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it, it made a very, uh, very strong impression uh, in the presentation of uh, Professor Carlson. Uh, the big uh, proportion uh, of rare liver diseases in the in the mortality from uh, from liver conditions. And here, and I think it's uh, uh, better to stop here with this final point. Uh, I see uh, two very uh, important uh, fields for political work. Uh, one is, of course, uh, funding research uh, for uh, rare diseases. Uh, and uh, the other one is uh, ensuring access to treatment for rare diseases uh, wherever research already has done some work and we have medical solutions, treatment solutions, because uh, we have access limitations on two levels within the European Union. One is a huge difference in access uh, by nationality from uh, one member state to another member state. And uh, the other is uh, by social criteria from less wealthy people to uh, people with uh, more uh, uh, more financial opportunities, but here I think there is a third layer or a second layer within the social issue, and it is uh, that uh, people uh, with higher living standards uh, tend to get much more information either on their condition or on the opportunities to have treatment for this condition. So it's not uh, a social issue only as a matter of uh, uh, having the means to pay for the treatment, because uh, this would be uh, much more the problem in the US, for example, than in Europe with much more robust social welfare system. Uh, but uh, the very, very question of uh, education and information 
on the possibilities for treatment of uh, existing conditions. A lot, a lot of people die from conditions that are basically treatable, but they simply don't know it, or they simply don't have the proper diagnosis. And I think this is already very much a political question and not strictly a, a scientific and medical one. So thank you once more for the opportunity, and I will stay with great interest to, to listen to the other participants on the panel. Thank you so much, Radan. You've touched on really, really key key topics, the important role of ECDC in gathering data to inform decision making at all levels, putting an accent, of course, on rare liver diseases, which is really critical in terms of, of, of research and indeed access, and also, of course, the, the health inequalities that are pervading across Europe within member states and the social determinants of health um, and the information dividend, the importance of health literacy quality information. That was great. I think we can now move into session two, which is all about promoting prevention care and targeted screening for high risk groups. And I'd like to welcome Professor Peter Jepson, who is part of the Eastern Liver Cancer Task Force. A warm welcome to you, Peter. I have a couple of, of quite burning, quite high level questions for you. And the first one, quite simply, is how many Europeans have been diagnosed with liver cancer? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you to everyone else for, for being here and for showing your interest in, in liver disease and liver cancer particularly. And uh, Nicola, the number is 50,000. 50,000 Europeans are diagnosed with liver cancer every year. Oof. Now, I, I, yeah, I, I cannot show you a, a figure, but I, maybe I can, I can paint a men mental picture for you. The number was 25,000 in 1990. That's 30 years ago, and it's gone up and up and up and up and up to now reach 50,000 in 2020. Now, the number of Europeans who die from liver cancer is almost exactly the same, meaning that almost everybody who is diagnosed with liver cancer dies from liver cancer. I mean, it's terrible, really saying that we have to do something. Yeah, my, my uncle, I have to say, died last year, so I know exactly what we're talking about here. Why do you think we, we've actually seen such an increase? What, what's, what's this trend all about? Yes, well, uh, to me, it's the combination of, of two factors. We have an aging European population and then not least a population with a very high prevalence and an increasing prevalence of chronic liver disease. And what's very important to realize is that between 80 and 90 percent of everybody who is diagnosed with liver cancer has an underlying chronic liver disease. And that's why we have such a focus on chronic liver disease when we talk about liver cancer. Preventing liver cancer means preventing chronic liver disease and vice versa. We have to prevent chronic liver disease. So Prevention is one dimension, but, but what else can we do about this? What, what is really the call for action from, from, from your perspective? Yes, so um, essentially we can talk about what I would call primary prevention, then there's secondary prevention and tertiary prevention. My, my focus will be on primary prevention, which is essentially preventing chronic liver disease from occurring. In the next presentations, you will hear more about secondary prevention, which is screening for liver cancer in the high risk groups, which are those people who already have chronic liver disease. So unlike screening for cervical cancer or colorectal cancer or breast cancer, when we talk about screening for those cancers, we are really screening the, the general population. But when we talk about screening for liver cancer, we're talking about a well-defined risk group of people who already have a chronic liver disease. This is a really fundamental difference. And just to, to complete, uh, when we talk about tertiary prevention of liver cancer death, it's, it's really about treating those who already have liver cancer. And I can tell you that we are making huge strides in, in these years, improving the care for patients who have liver cancer. But I think fundamentally, the, the most effective thing is to prevent liver cancer from developing altogether. And that essentially means preventing chronic liver disease from occurring. Great, thank you very much, Peter. Um, 
I think it's now time to, to, to look at a national context. And I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Pierre Naon, who's uh, an expert within Isla, to, to talk a little bit about, about France. Essentially, how in France do you integrate groups at high risk of liver cancer in, in the national cancer strategy? How, what has been your approach, Pierre? Yes, uh, thank you, Nicola, for this uh, question and, and overall for this invitation. This is uh, uh, this initiative is what we expect on the field of liver cancer because all happens upstream of liver cancer, as uh, Peter just said. And uh, clearly, what we are aiming at in France is to identify those patients that are at risk of liver cancer because we're not talking about the general population. So uh, this is all the keywords you 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 just used, Peter, with. Uh, identifying this uh, at-risk population and in the first session is reducing the inequity to access to healthcare because we, we just saw that migrants, people who inject drugs, people who drink, uh, have excessive alcohol consumption, this is general population and we have to get them and bring them to the healthcare uh, system because once we have identified those patients with chronic liver disease, then we can include them in liver cancer surveillance program, which is very simple uh, theoretically, because it's an ultra, if you have to keep just one uh, message from this, uh, uh, my talk is ultrasound every six months in patients that have advanced chronic liver disease. So this is very easy to do on the field, but we need these patients to come to our healthcare system. So this is the whole idea of preventing and identifying those patients and then uh, bringing them to the healthcare system through general practitioners and then to hospitals to uh, include them in SEC surveillance programs. So this is the whole key point for us on the field. And do you have a, a good example? Are you looking to a particular country or context in terms of liver cancer surveillance and screening in Europe? Who would be, if you like, first in class and what can we learn from that? Well, I, I would say I was very, very uh, uh, happy to hear uh, the, the, the uh, all the talks about the equity to access to care. Not surprisingly, in, 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 in countries such as France, where you have social security, where I'm not saying that everyone is uh, 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 in a good place here, but we tend with our social security to uh, lower the burden of inequity to access to care. So it's uh, as simple as that. And we see with association how to get these patients and to go uh, to these uh, doctors, practitioners, and, and uh, uh, de early detection programs. And I would just, uh, there is not such as harmonization in Europe of access to care. But if you compare, for example, in Asian countries where they have this massive screening uh, for liver cancer, it's a whole different uh, uh, mentality, for example, uh, in some uh, uh, enterprises in Japan, when you have hepatitis C, you have to go to your ultrasound every six months. Otherwise, the inequity to access to care. Great. So really looking at, at an, a, a more systematic, structured approach to screening across Europe, emulating perhaps the Asian approach would be important. Peter, do you have anything to add here? No, no, sorry. I, I, I think uh, Piano says it's uh, spot on. I mean, it's really a question of, I mean, we, we essentially, we, we know what to do. I mean, it, it's, it's really a, a matter of, of finding the patients and, and offering them, them screening. It's, it's, I mean, for us, it's, it's so simple, but, but still it's, it, it turns out it's, it's often difficult when it comes to the details. So, but, but we, we know it can work. As, as Pionon says, it, it's, it, it works in, in Southeast Asia. Great. We have a question that's come through for both of you, and I'll just jump in and take, to use the opportunity to, to pose this to you. Um, to you both, actually, why is the term liver cancer used to refer to HCC only? HCC is one primary liver cancer. CCA is also a primary liver cancer, very different to HCC. CCA is growing in incidence with a mortality that parallels that incidence, but is so neglected. Any comments? Let's kick off first, uh, perhaps with Pierre, and then then move to Peter. Yeah, this is true. These are the two most prevalent primary liver cancer, but clearly, the 
the proportion of HEC is uh, 10 times uh, higher than the cholangial carcinoma. Uh, there is something that we can uh, uh, conclude from a large epidemiological studies is that both HCC and cholangial carcinoma usually develop on the background of chronic liver disease. So basically when you screen patients with chronic liver disease for liver cancer, you screen them both for HCC and cholangial carcinoma. But of course, you can always find some HCC or primary liver cancer uh, or cholangial carcinoma developed on non cirrhotic liver disease. But this is quite a more, uh, 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 more infrequent situation. Great. Peter, comments from your side? Well, I don't have much to add to, to what Piano said. I, I fully agree. I think it's mainly uh, not to, to, to send a too complicated message. The, 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 the thing is, as Pierre says, it's 90% of primary liver cancers are HCCs. And with respect to the effect of screening, we know more about uh, the effect on HCC than on the effect of cholangiocarcinoma. But as Pierre also said, I mean, a side effect of screening for HCC is that you, at the same time, screen for cholangiocarcinoma. Great, good. Look, um, I think we can we can move on. I, I wanted to actually apologise on behalf of MEP Sarah Serdis, who was hoping to join this session, but has been caught up in, in travel chaos and cancellations. She's actually flying at this very moment from Portugal. She's hugely committed to health, being a doctor herself and is doing a lot on health in the European Parliament and will certainly play an active role in the MEP Friends of the Liver Group moving forward. So we can expect to see her at a future event. Let's now move then to um, Roberto perez Gao, who is part of the Correlation European Harm Reduction Network. Roberto, too often stigma and discrimination is a barrier to care and prevention. We heard this from, from Thomas right at the beginning of our session. This is very much the case with liver disease. What is being done actually on the ground at grassroots level to try and mitigate and address this issue? Yeah, effectively, <clears throat> particularly in our case from Correlation European Heart Reduction Network, we are a bit more focused on hepatitis C elimination. And uh, one of the things that for that happens is, as you know, it's epidemiological studies are indicating that injection, uh, dr drug use is normally the main driver of HIV infection in Europe with approximately like 80% of the new cases related to this uh, high risk behavior. But also like in our particular case, we see that also there is all the factors that include homelessness, unstable housing, ethnicity, gender, sex work, or imprisonment. So normally like all these interlink of conditions, sometimes they are bringing into creating a set of factors that lead to an exclusion to access to services particularly because uh, drug use and all of these other conditions, sometimes they are stigmatized through compounding, criminalizing and punitive laws that also are intersecting with one another. So from the ground up, from the level of civil society, for us, normally what we are trained to do is to work a bit on three different fields. One of them is like building evidence on what is the situation that is happening especially from the ground and from the lenses of uh, civil society and the communities themselves. Also on capacity building to respond from this uh, from this angle and also not advocacy. For example, one of the things that we're doing is like monitoring and data collection to assess the use and impact of, for example, of national strategies or guidelines on access to testing and treatment, especially trying to complement existing established information systems and bring in new ones, also like linkages between communities, factors or diseases, especially for those communities that normally are a bit overseen or not completely represented on the data sets. So, for example, we see it is important for us to address that although there is, for example, like national guidelines, oftentimes these guidelines, they are a bit outdated or they are articulating over complex screening and treatment systems that actually are not responding to the needs and the conditions of marginalized communities. Or sometimes there is a bit of like different disparities or also like disparities can happen also with access to, to uh, antiviral medications and drugs. For example, we see that although they are completely available in all countries, for example, in uh, currently in Europe, in 40% of these countries, there is restrictions to this access that they are normally related to active drug use. For example, antiviral medication is only accessible to those enrolled on, on opioid substitute treatment or little drug users or only restricted to those currently injecting drug use. 
And also we see that the access to this is normally done through infection disease clinics or other sort of specialized clinics that as we are seeing through a specific uh, practices and high threshold conditions, actually they become very exclusive to access to marginalized communities. Uh, another of the parts that we try to do is also with capacity building, trying to improve the continuum of care, because this is really important, a well-functioning continuum of care, including low threshold and harm reduction services is important, especially for accessibility, taking into consideration that sometimes other care centers cannot be accessed to being the possibility to include civil society organizations as an entry point within the continuum of care is quite important. And also we see that there is a lot of effort that needs to be happening or we try to put forward solutions into the coordination between healthcare and social care providers. Because sometimes, especially between information sharing, communication or serving provision all together, still there is need to create a multidisciplinary networks of strengths and support from the local level to the national and also passing through the European. Also, quite emphasis that we are doing on capacity building is on community-based and community-led access to treatment, but also testing and screening, and tiny bit working with the idea of one-stop testing and treatment models. So through this, especially current improvements on, 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 on biomedical access and medicines are providing this, and these new models of service are actually increasing uh, activities in the field of testing, screening, but also diagnosis and linkage of care. And they are resulting in actually interesting uh, capacity to, to actually uh, provide early diagnosis and treatment and also ideas of treatment between people who use drugs and marginalized communities. But also they give an entry point into also like, for example, providing education, information, social support, linkage to housing, assisting and monitoring drug use, or oftentimes and more and more often alcohol managed problems for those that actually are experiencing a dependence on alcohol. So in here, normally what we are developing is a whole series of like good practice collections, exchange of tools and trying to bring the capacity to actually upscale all of these models that they already exist and functioning. And then lastly on advocacy, although we are working to sort of like tackle all of these uh, better identification of the situation of those living in a situation of precarity or all of these reforms and transformations in typologies of system and models of liver care, uh, we also are very much trying to ensure that the human rights are just not enshrined in some sort of an idea of value, but they actually are resulting in concrete improvements of access to healthcare interventions for everyone. So, for example, ensuring that policymakers are delivering inclusive, people centered health services based on evidence informed more than an ideals. Also, ensuring that policymakers are cooperating meaningfully with community based and com with community led organizations is very important. And also another important element is to address punitive and criminalizing legislations, framework, law enforcement practices that result in an unjust distribution of resources and also unequal access to rights and capacities which are linked to health inequalities, deprivation and determinants of poor health. Great. Thank you very much, Roberto. I think you've really outlined extremely clearly the role of your organisation in driving things forward on the ground and bringing to life some of the, the scientific excellence that we've, we've, we've heard about earlier in this discussion. Thomas, in his introduction, alluded to the fact that we are living through very, very difficult, very challenging times. And we're having conversations today that we didn't imagine we would be having a couple of months ago, quite frankly, with regard to the situation in Ukraine. I imagine, Roberto, it's, it's a big preoccupation for you and, and your communities. And it would be great to get a, a little bit of insight very briefly on, on, on what you're doing there, um, because I think it is it is important. Yeah, currently at the moment, there is a whole system of harm reduction and emergency response to the war in Ukraine. Also because, I mean, Ukraine is currently the second highest hepatitis C country with prevalence in Europe. And then also is one of the countries with the highest prevalence of drug use in Europe. So that means that the war currently is actually putting in threat access to medication, opioid substitute treatment, access to basic care. And also uh, we are seeing that uh, although there is 
Ukraine has been doing in recent years a big effort regarding particularly of like communicable diseases and also like provision of medications like this was disrupting access to this. So on one hand, there is a whole level of advocacy, for example, trying to be working that the humanitarian corridors are respected because at the moment actually there's accessibility to the medications, but there is no possibility to deliver it to specific areas. And at the same time, there is a whole system within the neighbor countries in which we are working with all the organizations on the ground to be able actually to provide a access to medication and to be able to provide access to support and health in all of these countries because with some countries there is more flexibility than in others in how the programs are established for example for some medications are by in a whole package within a whole year and then accessing extra medication is complicated so there is a lot of like tweaking from the policy making but also the service provision that at the moment is happening at quite of a big speed <laughs> sure i don't know if if pierre Pizza, you'd like to comment? Yes, I just want to congratulate uh, all the uh, workers on the field that Roberto uh, uh, just uh, highlighted. It's a great, great work. And, and clearly, for, for my, my, my point of view, what, what we should do if we want to improve the prognosis of our patients is clearly the, the promotion of education is key. It's the education of, uh, of the populations, then the patients, because it's a lifelong uh, uh, commitment between a, a, a given patient and his uh, doctors and social workers or whatever, because once you have chronic disease, as we saw on the first session, if we want to be able to prevent uh, life-threatening complication, you have to take medication, you have to be compliant. And we have seen, for example, for liver cancer screening, that compliance is key for successful uh, early detection of cancer that can lead to years of survival as compared to patients that miss their appointments. And then they are diagnosed with advanced uh, liver cancer. And uh, despite immunotherapy, etc., we have only a few months of survival. So clearly, uh, what uh, this educational uh, uh, field of chronic liver disease and liver cancer management, I think. Thank you very much, Pierre. Peter? I have nothing to, to add, really. I think it's extremely well put by first Roberto and then uh, Pierre Neon, what the, the challenges are. So nothing to add from my side. Thank I you. Second the, Great. I think we can now move uh, slowly but surely into the Q&A and all of you uh, please remain and we'll be bringing in some of the other speakers very briefly. We've only got 10 minutes for this. I just want to um, quickly look at the um, at the Q&As on, on the screen. Um, again, focusing very much on CCA, the fact that data is poor for that. There's an advertisement for a conference on the 11th and 13th of May to delve a little bit deeper. And then there's the proposal that maybe a recommendation, a recommendation of the commission might be quite helpful in this specific space. So all very important food for, throat, for thought. Any other questions coming through, please, this is the time to add them to the Q&A piece. Um, but in the meantime, I know that MEP Francis Fitzgerald wanted to pose a question and, um, and also to um, acknowledge her, her interest in the area of liver health. Francis, please, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm here in Dublin and I'd like to thank Professor Frank Murray for inviting me to be a friend of the group. And I'm very happy to do that. I've been working on health issues uh, in the parliament and as previously as a minister here in Ireland. I think there's much we can do, and I'd really like to thank all of the speakers this morning, Nicola, because it's been very informative and very interesting um, to make a few very quick points in relation to how we can work at European level. Um, obviously, everything is through the Ukrainian lens, as we've said at present, but clearly this is also and has been a time when I think there is greater interest in health issues in the parliament. Uh, previously, you know, national subsidiarity really was predominant. Now I think we're really looking much more at how as politicians and indeed the commission, but the commission always did it to some degree, but certainly in the parliament, how we can work across Europe on these health issues. And what we've been discussing this morning in relation to liver disease lends itself completely, I think. So I'm very honored to become a friend uh, of the group. And a, a couple of points I would make is that you know, best practice sharing, uh, funding for research, 
Um, and uh, sharing best practice, I think, really can make quite a difference. We have some terrific examples. And I think the Parliament can make a role, uh, you know, play quite a big role in highlighting that. Uh, I was very disappointed recently when we launched the cancer plan and we had the discussion about alcohol. I was really quite stunned, to be honest with you, at the level of discussion in relation to alcohol and how uninformed it was and how predominant the alcohol industry and lobbying was. I was quite shocked because I'm used to the discussion here in Ireland and we had made a lot of progress and the politicians had really taken on board the prevention and I'm very interested in prevention, had taken on board the prevention messages and the other points that our speakers were making earlier. But I found that the economic issues and the alcohol lobbying uh, industry predominated in much of the discussion. So it really highlighted to me how much work we have to do in relation to this uh, issue at European level and indeed in the Parliament. So I think there's scope for us to bring the expertise we heard this morning right into the Parliament in a more, uh, in, a, in a stronger way, I would say. There is an issue of gender. The question I would have would be in relation to gender uh, and young people. I think there's much we can do to reach out to women who I think are probably increasingly a vulnerable and we need to take a gender lens to this issue as well I think and much more uh, we need to do far more and this year is the year of youth in in Europe and uh, given the Icelandic experience and other experiences I think we could do far more uh, across Europe to introduce this as a topic uh, for discussion both in the conference on the future of Europe which is coming to a close but a lot of young people have been involved in that but also during the events in this year of youth so that's something that we might be able to follow up Nicola in an interesting way look there are other points I would like to make but actually I know you're very short of time and you have other questions thanks Nicola and thank you to everyone and I'm delighted to be your friend and look forward to working with you all Thank you very much, Francis, for that very clear statement. Obviously, your policy brief here is really, really clear, and also the clear message that there are opportunities to move forward. Um, I think the, the, the report obviously alluded to young people, and I'd just like to bring Tom in to actually address the issue of gender. Uh, Francis, you rightly highlighted that perhaps women are more vulnerable. Uh, Tom, any, any reflections from your perspective having having really led the work with the Lancet and ESL? I mean talking about you know uh, aspects of discrimination and, and, and gender has a strong voice throughout the, the, the entire uh, commission. Uh, this is clear from from many areas and we also bring forward some of the data. I mean for instance there are data on uh, discrimination related to uh, transplant uh, waiting lists uh, entries. Uh, uh, however, I think it's it's important also that to, to, to bring forward, you know, what what we what we do in the commission is is not only to focus on, on on singular aspects like that. We also talk about age. I mean, we have this major emphasis on the young, but we also have an emphasis on 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 the elderly population of Europe, which is uh, certainly also in 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 many ways. Uh, uh, being discriminated, there's this phenomenon of ageism. This is also a theme within the Commission. So, so I think um, I think that there are many many such contrasts that can be made, and and, and certainly this is this is part of the of, of the way going forward. Yeah. Great. And if anybody else from the panel would like to comment, please just just put your hand up, and I can bring you in. Um, ah, Peter, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes. In. Uh, in connection with what uh, Francis Fitzgerald told us, uh, in Denmark we have seen a, a decrease in per capita alcohol consumption for, for many years and actually also a, a decrease in the incidence of alcohol-related liver disease. And we've also seen a reduction in alcohol consumption among our youth. Nonetheless, we are still among uh, um, our young are those in Europe who drink the most alcohol. And in response to that, our government this morning uh, launched a, a proposal to, to ban alcohol sales to young Danes aged under 18. It used to be, uh, the current law is, is under 16, but, but now the proposal is to, to, to increase this, this age limit so that you now have to be 18 years old to be able to buy uh, beer and low strength alcohol in, in Denmark. 
So uh, I, I'll be very interested to see how that goes, whether that is finally um, agreed upon. Um, so also recognizing what Francis said about uh, the industry um, response or um, opposition is perhaps a better word. Indeed, a very interesting case in point. Thank you for sharing the, the, the Danish context. We have another question, and I think, Tom, you did allude to this in your presentation, but perhaps you could unpack it a little bit more. Is liver prevention actually at the same time prevention for other major diseases, just in a nutshell? Um, and as I say, I know that you, you alluded to that in your, your presentation, but just a key couple of messages here. I think you're still on mute. Uh, absolutely. I think I think one of the points that we're making in the commission is that the liver has to be recognized alongside these other uh, uh, obesity related conditions like type two diabetes, for instance, in the WHO uh, categorization and listing liver disease is missing. So, I mean, for instance, when you're talking about obesity, type two diabetes, everybody is thinking about cardiovascular disease, everybody is talking about kidney disease, you're even most people would be aware that they have to check their eyes, but nobody's really uh, uh, mentioning liver disease. And if you look at, for instance, type two diabetes practice guidelines, liver disease has been mostly absent, there is also a Lancet Commission on type two diabetes, type two diabetes, there is no mentioning of the risk of fatty liver disease or the risk of, of progressive liver fibrosis in these patients in these documents. So uh, certainly, we're just asking for uh, a place uh, alongside these other uh, entities, we're not asking for disease competition or the one disease being more important than the others, but liver disease is there alongside these other manifestations of ongoing risks to the European population and, 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 and has to be accounted for in the same way that these other complications are. Absolutely. I think that is also something that's really very important across the patients movement, that there isn't that competition. I think there's enough in terms of challenges and we need to really move forward together collaboratively. This is something that I've learned in my experience over the years. The last question, I think, very, very quickly is, is the role of GPs and how can we get them to be more active in actually detecting earlier? Um, any thoughts on that while I still have you on the floor, Tom? I think, I think we had several primary care physicians on the panel. We had a, a separate working group. And uh, one of the things that we try to do in the commission is to simplify. Because uh, we had, coming to our GP colleagues, uh, 15 ways of diagnosing early uh, stages of liver disease. And they said, come on, how are we supposed to be choosing amongst those 15 ways of doing this? You have to tell us. So I think that there is this one, um, one responsibility residing with hepatologists in actually communicating simple and clear guidance to our primary care colleagues. Secondly, I think this point that I already made that this is not a, an additional disease problem adding to a mountain of problems that primary care physicians already have to deal with. They're already dealing with these patients because they're seeing them for their type 2 diabetes, they're seeing them in context of, of alcohol uh, uh, um, uh, addiction problems, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the patients are already there, but just kind of asking for an additional dimension into to, to handling these patients. And, and finally, mm -hmm. there are, and there is a panel of recommendations related to that. Uh, there are aspects related to reimbursement, lab laboratory systems, autom automation, etc. But uh, in, in principle, simple guidance and uh, not adding to burden, but helping our colleagues in, in, in just seeing this additional dimension of the patients that they're anyway seeing. Yeah. Great, thank you. Pierre, I think you wanted to come in. Can I ask you to be very, very brief because we're coming up to the end? Yeah, this was just to add a comment on this because, of course, General practitioners are on the front line to identify patients with advanced chronic liver disease. Fibrosis, the main issue is liver fibrosis, and it can be tested by a non patented blood test uh, just using simple algorithm. And the, the, the easel community and the liver community is trying to uh, simplify, as uh, Dr. Carson just said, uh, to simplify and not add uh, the burden of, of calculating these uh, complicated scores for practitioners. But this is coming and this is uh, hopefully in the, in the next years. Great, thank you very much Pierre and thank you, thanks to all of you for, for your really excellent, excellent contributions.
I think we've all learned a great deal today through the discussion, and I think it bodes extremely well for the impact of the MEP Friends of the Liver group moving forward. Allow me now to give the floor to Professor Marie Bouti, who is ESL's EU policy counsellor. Marie, thank you so much for joining us today and, and for sharing some thoughts from, from your side to, to close this, this very vibrant meeting. Over to you. Thank you, Nicola. They are honorable members of the European Parliament, they are colleagues, they are ladies and gentlemen. I congratulate the efforts and goodwill to relaunch the ESL MEP Friends of the Liber Group. And my wish is that this group becomes a powerful means to put Liber Health higher on the political agenda. We highly appreciate the support of all of you, of the MEPs who signed up today in these challenging times, and we thank them very, very much. ESEL, having an European mission in terms of population health, uh, we are implementing measures to support the pathology community in Ukraine, as well collaborated with physicians in the front line, in their responsibilities towards the refugees with liver disease. Uh, this group has a very ambitious working plan. First, as Thomas, as Tom has shown, addressing the burden of liver disease, including uh, its prevention, early detention, and care. Then, uh, tackling the causes of liver disease, obesity, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, viral hepatitis, harmful uh, alcohol consumption, and then promoting a healthy lifestyle, a healthy uh, diet without uh, forgetting the issue, as Roberto has mentioned, of stigma for liver patients. Uh, we must give our continued attention to strengthening evidence-based decision-making and to building dialogue and trust between healthcare professionals and policy makers. When we agree to work together, we can achieve a lot. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, this forum will not only help uh, build uh, dialogues with our elected officials and support them in their mission, but also provide support to healthcare professionals, uh, researchers, uh, and of course, uh, then uh, to our patients. It is crucial that when we raise awareness of how important it is for us to understand and to collaborate in the development of healthcare policy. So I also thank my colleagues very much for supporting this initiative, highlighting the science. Last but not least, I thank the patients and the patients advocates uh, present today here with their opinions, with their testimonies, uh, patients and their needs uh, must always be at the center of uh, health uh, policy. We are looking forward to, continues, uh, to continue uh, our work together. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, and that ends the meeting of today. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you to all of you for listening in, and particularly our speakers. Thank you very much.